think we might make a start. We've still got a few people joining us both via the VC system and via the, um, the Google Hangout. Uh, so can I welcome you all along to uh, the first of our three Cloud Share support sessions uh, this term. Uh, as you know, today we've got Greg Swanson with us. So uh, those on the Hangout, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, rotate my screen so you can see Greg, there he is. And uh, next to Greg, we have uh, Donovan Chung. So Donovan's our Cloud Share support officer for uh, today. Uh, sorry, for this term. Just for today. Just, just for today. <laughs> and uh, as you know, Greg Swanson's our uh, senior learning project officer who works with, uh, with uh, myself and Donovan here in the office as well. So today, Greg's going to uh, uh, deliver a presentation on Google and iOS devices or mobile devices. This is the first, as I said, of three sessions that we'll be running uh, this term. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be presenting a session on uh, using the YouTube editor. So we're looking forward to that. Lots of exciting things happening there. And then uh, a couple of weeks after that, uh, John Galvin, who can't be with us today, who's uh, our Cloud Share in-school support officer. He's, uh, as, as the name suggests, he's in schools today, so he's, he's not with us uh, for this session. But he'll be doing a, uh, a session on building learning communities, uh, build, sorry, building online learning communities. So with that, um, I'll welcome everybody. Uh, I, I guess quickly just a special welcome to Alma LaRoe, who's coming to us from um, uh, Pimble Ladies College. So this is, I think, the first time we've brought in a school that's actually not part of the CEO, and we've been able to connect up uh, with uh, PLC. So I think uh, Alma may have some, some of her staff joining us as well. So welcome along, Alma. Some of you may recognise Alma from um, being, uh, unfortunately, we lost her. She defected <laughs> um, uh, a few uh, earlier this year. Um, but she was our Cloud Share Support Officer last year and, of course, did a great job as the e-learning coordinator over at Mary McKillop College and at Wakeley um, and is now working in e-learning over at PLC. So welcome along, Alma. Um, all right, well, look, I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague, Greg, and I think we'll get started on, on the session. Uh, just a, as a matter of etiquette, and I can see everyone on the Hangouts done that, if you could just mute your microphones, if you're not, um, if, you, if you don't need to say anything, uh, and uh, so that, that just uh, help, helps minimise uh, feedback. Uh, any other housekeeping things we need to do, Greg? No, I don't think so. I think we're pretty good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm uh, so people on the Hangout, I'm just about to mute my microphone. So I'm going to mute that now. And uh, Greg, you'll need to unmute your microphone. So um, if you just uh, unmute there and go back. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, can I just, uh, first of all, say thank you for turning up. There's nothing worse than trying to organise one of these and then sitting there with uh, an empty screen in front of you. So I think we have nearly 40 people um, who had registered for today. I'm, I'm not sure we've got 40 people, but uh, it is an impressive turnout. So thanks for turning up. It's always good for your ego when that happens. Um, can I just say, if there's anybody who attended slide to learn I'm going to apologise now. When, uh, when Greg saw the presentation that I did at one of the uh, presentations I did at slide to learn he said, oh, that, that would be fantastic for a cloud share support session. So um, I have sort of recycled it. I have changed it slightly. Greg went through it and said, oh, I need extra on this and I don't need any on that. So, so he's, uh, he's ridden roughshod over the presentation. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I've shared this presentation with you. So if you want to just uh, type in that uh, shortened URL at the bottom of the screen now, you can have access to that. I'm happy for you to take this presentation and do what you need to it. So if you want to rewrite it, if you want to take it, make a copy of that and share that with your staff, I'm happy for you to re-edit that. Um, so I'm not precious about this. This has been made for all of us. Uh, so please feel, feel free to share that. I really like to start the whole uh, conversation we're going to have this afternoon with this whole notion of why cloud-based education is important. And as more and more of us move into um, a BYOD program and more and more of us are going one-to-one, -one, it really is important for us to have an idea of how this is going to change our pedagogy. So on one level, it's really interesting now where we're talking about access to resources from a student's point of view at any time, anywhere. 
And it doesn't matter whether they're waiting for the bus or they're sitting at home or, or they've been dragged to their sister's netball training. If they've got Wi-Fi, they can actually access some of their school material. They can be working on uh, whether it's a Google Doc or a presentation for work. But it also gives them that opportunity to collaborate and to communicate and share. And we've probably all had kids of our own or, or have set assignments where you, know, you say to them, right, well, you'll have to organise to meet up because we want this to be a collaborative exercise. And the beauty of uh, iOS and cloud education and, and uh, Google is that they can each be sitting on their lounge room, uh, in their, on their lounge room floor, uh, talking to each other and collaborating via a Google Doc and chat and all the other facilities. But the beauty for me of the iPad and iOS is the ability for students to really personalise their education. So when I say to a, a group of kids, right, next week I'd really love to do uh, mind mapping. Here's five apps that I think uh, we've already suggested that you get, but you're more than welcome to, to grab an app that most suits your own learning style. Um, often we find kids come in with all sorts of things, and it's the ability for them to have that choice and to have that voice in their own education that really gets the buy-in around engagement and the buy-in around them taking responsibility for their own learning. So there's a couple of things. I'd love to get some indication. I'm happy for people to put hands up. Um, who's using Google in their classroom? Okay, we've got a few. Who's got iPads in their classroom? Who's using Google on the iPad in their classroom? Good, got a couple. Excellent. And, and I suppose I've snuck this one in only because uh, a, couple of, um, a couple of days ago we started to um, test a little Google form that we're going to send out. And we were interested to know whether the kids knew the term cloud share. So I'd be interested to get a show of hands as well about if you think your, your students would know what cloud share was. Anyone? Oh, oh one or two? Okay, that's good. Now look, I'm just going to throw that out there for your reflection. Um, I'm wondering what you're using to describe the suite of tools that you're using with your students. I know Greg and I would love for you to call, to call that cloud share. We're not insisting, but um, it is great that we've branded that within the CEO so that when we talk about it, when we talk to staff, they instantly know what we're talking about. Oh, where we could do that um, with our students as well. So look, let's uh, let's just put this into a little bit of context. Um, they have changed the uh, the app store. In the past, in the past, we used to be able to see how many apps were designed just for Google. And uh, the last time we did this was probably the last boot camp. And the last uh, the last time we had a look, the number of apps for you to be able to access Google, not Google apps, but just to access Google, were well over 1,100. And there were, there were over uh, 2,800 for accessing Google Apps on the iPhone. I, I think uh, Google's going to eat Apple up. I, I'm not going to put my money on it. I wouldn't bet my house on it, but I think they'll probably eat them from the inside. Um, Greg, sorry just to interrupt. I think um, Alma's just saying that there's a little bit of feedback on the, um, on the, the microphone. Alma, is that okay now, or is there still feedback? It's okay. Great. Thank you. So if you're, um, if you're thinking about an iOS device, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose any functionality for the apps that you've already been using. And I, I've just thrown a couple of those apps that I use every day. I've got my Gmail account. I use my um, Google Drive app every day. I use Chrome. I use um, Google Chat. It doesn't mean you have to give up those sorts of tools. And in fact, even... Quite recently, um, there's been um, a couple of uh, changes to the iOS where your, if you open a link from Chrome, it starts to open it directly into the app uh, on your iPad. So that's a, a really nice little feature that's coming up. Greg, um, just sorry, another one. We've just got some, um, Alma saying that she can't get access to the presentation. Have you shared? Oh, I might have shared that to everyone within the CEO. I'm, I'll share that with her later. Okay, all right. Do, do, you, do you have access to share it? Uh, I'm just looking for it and I can't. That's um, there. Oh, it's just saying 28th of June. So I wasn't sure if it, that was the coming. Okay. 
It's fine. Please don't look now. It's it's not a problem. It's just that the Google shortcut link just said that it was wrong. It didn't work, and I checked thoroughly, so I just thought okay. I'd Okay. Yeah, that's the old one. Sorry. Greg, it's me. It's Mark saying that it was an old link as well. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me uh, really really quickly have a look at that. And I'll cut that in. Okay, I need to show that again. Okay, so I'll just jump back to that front screen just so that you can grab the new link. So new. And Alma still may not have access to that because. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's all right. fine. Just share it with anyone here. Okay. Well, okay. You missed it. You missed it. So for me, um, one of the things that I really like on uh, iOS is the ability to have all of my um, all of my experience synced across all of my devices. So if I'm signed into Chrome and I save a bookmark, it not only is it saved on my iPad, it's all it's also saved on my laptop and it's also saved on my phone. And that works for my bookmarks, it works for my uh, my history, all of my passwords, extensions, everything. The other thing from a Chrome point of view is that um, I would suggest to you that it operates on par with Safari. So Safari is the, um, the native um, internet browser on the iOS machine. The thing with Chrome though is it's actually got a couple of added features. So Chrome has an actual data compression feature. So this reduces both your data usage on your Wi-Fi and your 3G connection. It also significantly increases your page load time. So they're the sorts of things that make it really obvious for us um, about why we, why we recommend this from a system perspective. And you know, most of you guys would realise that the key to, to, um, to cloud share is really based within your Gmail. So your Gmail is your sort of your passport to all those other Google apps. And it's what provides your authentication and your access into your Google tools. So for me, I used to, I'm a simple man. I admit that, very simple. I used to use four, three or four different email clients for my three or four different um, email accounts. And it was really simple because I could keep them separate. I knew one was for the blog. I knew one was for work. One was private. What I like about the new Gmail, however, is that I can have multiple accounts and I can just switch between them. So you'll see on the screen now I've got an arrow with a circle. You can have up to five Gmail accounts all uh, attached to this one app. And I, I mean, I've got a lot. I don't have five. I think if you've got five different uh, email accounts, you're doing pretty well. But I simply just uh, click on each one that I want and it will, within a two second rotation, bring up my other account. So I don't have to sign out of one and sign into another. I can quickly flip between my different email accounts. Why do I like Gmail? For me, it's that ability. It really is the ability to have multiple sign-ins, but it's all the other features that go with it. So it's the ability to still tap into threaded conversations. It's the ability to have notifications. And, and sometimes that can be annoying, especially if you've got your three devices on the table. But if I've only got my phone on me and I know that I get a notification and it's set up, just, uh, set up for my iPad, I'll also get notifications come through on my phone and I come through on my laptop and if I've got my desktop on it, we'll um, ping on that as well. So often my wife sort of just looks across the lounge room when she hears ping, 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 because it goes off in four different places. But you can't miss it, I do love it. The other thing I like about the Gmail is that you've got all the features of your normal desktop, um, the Gmail client, so you can archive your emails, you can star them, you can um, spam report, um, I love it because I rarely, if ever, get any spam come through on my Gmail. When I go through and have a look at my um, spam folder, often there's hundreds there and I just dump the lot. But it does such a good job on keeping that out of my um, inbox. It's, it really is one of the um, better features of Gmail. Alright, so I've got Gmail, but what else is available? So 
you know, remember, this is you've got to explain this to your kids as well. The Gmail is the anchor for all the other tools. There's a couple of really clever tools on iOS devices that I just want to bring to your attention. So look, that's this is uh, I'm an art teacher, okay? We were laughing before we came on. That's my color-coded Google Apps. Um, I apologize, I know, I, it just soothes my mind, okay? Forgive me. So these are some of the apps that I use regularly. So I've got Drive and Chrome, you know, you, you would understand why we have that. I've got my Gmail there, my Blogger, my Google Plus. There's a couple there that you may not know of. So Google Currents is a good one. It's just a nice little, uh, like an RSS feed where I can have things brought to me. I sit back and things get brought to me, news stories that I like. Um, links to sites that I've um, nominated. There's a whole lot of stuff there. I also like Google Plus, and I know Google Plus has been um, not been turned on for students, but I will talk about that in a minute. We've also got a couple of apps there that are not specifically Google apps, but are to be used within the Google platform. So Touch Docs is another great one that I know St. Michael's at Lane Cove were using. So before uh, Teacher Dashboard, Touch Docs was a fantastic way of collating documents from your students, and even though they've now got um, Teacher Dashboard, there are times where they still use that. Don't forget, you've still got your, your normal um, apps, your Google apps that used to be in Google Drive, so you've got Sheets and um, Google um, Docs as well. So let's just have a, couple, a look at a couple of those in a little bit more detail. Google Drive for me is like, the ants pants, it's that productivity suite. Uh, there's lots of collaborative features there. You've got, you've still got access to slides and sheets and sites. The reality, however, is that I think Google are positioning this as a competitor to Dropbox. Um, I think you'll, as they continue to strip features out of Google Drive and they become independent apps, um, you need to just be aware that I think some features will be lost in Drive itself. While we've still got them, however, it's fantastic to have um, 50 pe people collaborating on a doc at any one time. You've still got that ability to share with 200 individual email addresses. But really, that, that 200 doesn't really need to limit you because you've got the ability to share with groups, and groups is just classified as a single email. So you could be sharing that with many hundreds of people if you wanted to. So be aware if you haven't noticed that uh, Google Sheets and Google Docs have come out as individual apps, um, have a look at those. They're, they've got all of the features that uh, they did in Drive. I was a little bit surprised. I was hoping that they would have had more features. Really the only feature um, uh, I'll talk about in a minute, but the only feature is the ability to work uh, offline and then it syncs when you come back into your Wi-Fi environment. So remember you've still got your 20 gig uh, in Google Drive. This is significantly better than you're going to get in iCloud and I know iCloud will be pushed in the next little while by Apple. Problem for me is I think they're probably four or five years um, behind the game. Google's already there. Google have been working really hard at this. And I know when, when we first moved to CloudShare, Doug Ashley, the director of ICT, came into a meeting one day and said, you know what, I'm going to move to the um, cloud. I want everyone to come with me. And so everyone in the office did. So I've been working solidly in Drive for three years now and I've only just hit 16% of my total quota. And there are people here who, who do a significantly more work um, in the cloud than me. Phil Hogg's a great example. I ran into him the other day. His is only at 4%. And he's, he's probably, that's indicative of how clever he is um, around the use of Google. So it's now 30 gig. Oh, good. Good, that's nice to know. So Stephen just said on uh, on the chat on um, Google Hangout that we're now we've got Google Drive up to 30 gig. The the one thing I would remind you if you're on the um, iPad and I got caught myself here at an in service one day in the southern region, if you're on the iPad and you go to share documents, you actually have to share individually with the person that you want to have editing rights. So if you're going to do that with a group, um, it doesn't work with a group invitation. You actually have to individually share that with people. Can I chime in on one one quick thing there? Um, in two things actually, uh, the 30 gig that Stefan mentioned uh, around. It can go back to the previous yep. slide. Thanks. The the 30 gig that Stefan mentions there actually includes your email as well. 
So it's email and drive together gives you your 30 gig. Uh, but generally for most people, that's not, that's not a problem. And the reason why it's not a problem for most people is that second paragraph you've got there, Greg, about Google files not counting towards your quota. So that's a fantastic incentive to convert, you know, your Word and Excel and whatever other documents over to a, a Google Doc. Yeah. Um, it, because it, it effectively it gives you infinite storage. And and I th that's probably a really good explanation of why Phil's got 4%. He's yeah. probably a lot clever about what he's uploading as Google Docs, mm. where I might probably have uh, some Word Docs there that we need for official documents in the office, or PDFs, or yeah. um, or uh, movies that I haven't converted. Mm. Um, now look, yeah. I still think, and I, I hope people know about this, I love this about Google Drive. For me, it's the plus sign in that top uh, right hand side of the screen. So when I'm in Google Drive, I can have my kids in Google Drive and I can get them to video directly from that app. Now the beauty of that is they don't have to muck around with saving it to Google Drive. It will automatically save the film or the photos straight into their drive. And if I've been really clever, what I've done is I've set up a shared folder already, got them to go into the folder, then go up to the plus button, hit the plus, access their camera, record their little piece of um, footage, and it's saved directly into that shared folder. Now that just takes so much grief out of collecting work from students. The other good thing is um, in the last update of Google Drive, they, um, they tweaked the coding so that all the video is now um, made available in HTML5, which means that you can access that on any mobile device. The other thing I really like about Drive is when you're in a document, it's really clean. All you see is the document. When you hit the little information button and you can see the little icon there on top of the screen on the right hand side there, this little box slides out from the right. So you've got all the features that you originally had. You can still share a document, delete a document, rename it, get a link, all of those things. You can star it. You can even allow for that uh, individual document to be worked on offline. And at any time I can just flick that straight back to the right and I'm just accessing my normal doc. The other good thing is from right from that little uh, menu item there, I can add people for the um, document sharing. So from a kid's point of view, I think that's really nice that we can get rid of the menu. It gives them more screen space to be working on their document. They can see more people collaborating on that doc. Um, at any time that they need the menu, they just uh, drag, uh, go back to the little uh, icon hit on the icon and they've got access to that menu. So that's, uh, that's the old Google Drive. Uh, we've got a new Google Docs independent app, which I mentioned earlier. And to be honest, much of that functionality is exactly the same. Uh, and I also mentioned earlier, the only real difference is that ability to edit offline. Now, as we move into a BYOD environment, more and more people are going to be Wi-Fi reliant. Now, I think one of the things that Google's really starting to do well is to give us access to apps and features offline. They realize, our, they realize that we're moving, that everyone is moving into a BYOD environment. They're also aware that um, without that Wi-Fi access, that many of those devices are pretty useless. So we, uh, Greg and I uh, were in at Google the other day having a conversation a couple of weeks ago they're starting to explain to us that we're going to have access to Google, um, sorry, we're going to have access to YouTube offline. We can cache videos. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, apps that will be bring, being brought offline. So as that comes to light, we'll try and share that via our Google Guides um, email list. This is a bit disappointing from my point of view. So um, I'm going back, we first made this slide about six or seven weeks ago. And at the time on social media and Google, Google was saying, look, Google Slides is going to be out. It's going to be out in a week or two. Six weeks down the track, I've changed my slide. So I've crossed out week, and it's just going to be sometime soon. It's going to be quite soon within the future, but we have no idea when that's going to be. We've asked the question. We really haven't had a, um, a response from Google. Um, I think they're probably trying to add more features than um, they originally were. So we're just going to have to be patient there. But it's like everything else. It's, it's, they're moving fast. They're breaking things. We're getting this stuff rolling out on a regular basis, and it's coming out. And it's really good quality stuff. 
All right, so they're, they're the main apps. They're the, the iOS apps that most of you have probably played around with at some time or another. What I want to do is throw a couple of other nice little options at you. Google Plus. Now, for me, this is around teachers, right? We, we don't have Google Plus enabled for uh, students, and that's around the fact that it's a 13 plus service. From a professional development point of view, Google Plus is excellent. You, um, if you haven't created your Google Plus profile yet, can I really recommend that you just spend that two minute to do that? And the first thing I would do is I'd recommend that you have a look at the Google Plus communities. There's communities there on the use of Chromebooks in classrooms. There's um, Chromebook apps. There's iPads in education. There's apps for education. Some of these Google groups have five and 6,000 members. So all of a sudden you have five or 6,000 people finding resources for you, finding um, apps for you. You just sit back and let them throw them at you. You know, it's, it's one of those things about working smarter and not working harder. So Google Plus is definitely one of the ones that I would recommend. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever get to a stage uh, where we have that open for all students, but I will flag for you that in the inner west, we have a project running there um, where we're doing a multi-campus course. And one of the things we have done is enable Google Plus just for those schools, just to see if that's going to assist that. So we do have some testing involved. There's a bit of a pilot program going on. Again, when a decision's made around that, especially for the high schools, um, we'll, we'll let you know. The other one I love, and again, this is from a professional point of view and from a classroom point of view. So a Google Hangout is, uh, is a great tool to just connect with other teachers. Sometimes you need to be face to face. Sometimes you need the, to be able to read that body language, the, the facial expression, all of those things. Sometimes you just need to sort of unload with another teacher. Uh, it was rolled out last week, I believe, that you no longer have to have a Google Plus profile in order to access Google Hangouts. Um, very, very easy to use. And on the iPads, um, a much better interface than on the laptop. Takes all of your um, contacts from your uh, Gmail and it self-populates. So as I start to type it in, I could type in Greg and up would come Greg Basswood, Greg Swanson, you know, all the other Gregs in the organisation. Uh, and at any time, if you want to just access, and you can see on the um, slide there, all the people that I've had um, uh, Hangouts with, if I just slide them to the right, it gives me the option of um, dialing back into a Hangout with them. So really easy to connect. And I don't have to do a video hangout. I can just do a voice hangout if I like. Now, look, I'm just going to take two minutes to do a little aside here. It's I want to make you aware of Google Live to Air Hangouts. If you don't know what a Google Live to Air Hangout is, you really, really need to investigate it. So when I'm on my laptop, it, it doesn't have the feature on the iOS yet, but when I'm on my laptop, one of the features that I've got when I go into a Hangout is to go live to air. And when it goes live to air, it does a couple of things. The first thing it does is that it broadcasts it live to your Google Plus page. So at the moment, I think, is the limit still 12 people in a Hangout? 15. 15, good. So you can get 15 people in a Hangout. But if I broadcast it live to my Google Plus page, all I need to do is invite people to that page and they can watch it. I could ha literally have hundreds of people watching that. And it's live. The second thing it does is that it records the Hangout. Now, I love that. Why? Well, because not everybody who wants to come to that Hangout might be able to come at that particular time. Not only does it record it, it automatically uploads it to YouTube for me. Now, I can go in later and use the YouTube editing tools, and, you know, I can top and tail it, I can put a title on it, I can put some credits on it. And you'll learn all about that. In a fortnight, oh, sorry. when Donovan does his okay. YouTube editing. I, I won't talk about YouTube anymore. <laughs> so, that's all right. It's a good now, plug. For me, I, I'm just going to show off here for one second. I'm just going to turn my iPad on. Um, this is why one of the reasons that I started to use um, live to air Hangouts. So I've just got my iPad here. I've just, I've got my iPad here. I'm going to share that with my. I'm going to airplay that to my laptop. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. So, I'll, I'll go to a screen that's a little bit different. There's, there's my old screen, that's my home screen. Imagine 
if I want to do a how-to video on my iPad. This live to air hangout will record my voice and it will record exactly what's on my screen. It will upload it instantly to YouTube for me and I've got an instant how-to video. I don't have to worry, I can just do a quick and dirty one. I just want my kids to know how to make a, uh, an annotative image in Sketch. I can open up uh, the app, I can talk them through the whole process, it's recording for me and I'm done. I love that feature. I just think that's um, one of those things that's really, really clever about Hangouts. Greg, uh, Albine uh, over at St. Joseph's Oatley has asked, what app or software are you using to share the iPad with the laptop, please? Okay, good question. I should have said, I should have told you, haven't I? So it's actually called Air Server, um, and Air Server is a app that cost me $14.95, and it goes on my laptop. But what it does is it creates a Wi-Fi connection between my laptop and my iPad, and it means that I can broadcast whatever is on my um, iPad onto my uh, laptop. If I buy five at a time, instead of $15, I can get them for $10 each. So I just go down the bottom of the screen, I hit um, broadcast, it comes up, I stop mirroring, and I'm back to my presentation. What I love about this is if I do it in a classroom, and I've seen this done really, really well in a primary class, teacher has their laptop connected to their interactive whiteboard. The kids know that um, they can just lift up their iPad screen and share it to the AirServe. And if the kids are sitting in front of the whiteboard, what they can do is they can share their assessment and get feedback from the group. So they often just stand there, they, they step to the back of the group, they say, look, I'm not, I'm not finished yet, but I would really love some feedback. Where's some areas I might be able to improve? What have I done well? What do I need to do more work on? Anyway, let's jump back to the presentation. The next one I'd love to uh, share with you is Google Search. Now again, uh, this is probably from a primary perspective. The reason I love Google Search is I can go to my, my one screen, my app screen, where I've got all the applications on one screen. It's really neat, it's really tidy. Um, you used to be able to do image searches from Google Search, and they've taken that feature out, but um, I'm just, as soon as they get another app that does that, I will put that on uh, the Google Cloud Share email. So Google search is nice for those kids that you don't want to get distracted. This is like its own little screen there. You have a lot of the um, main uh, Google apps there ready to use. That's a really nice little app for me. This one I love, and I, I hope I'm not stealing um, Donovan's Thunder for next week or the week after, but Google Capture is a app that I only came across about six or eight weeks ago. Google Capture allows you to video and again, it will automatically upload that to YouTube for you. But before it does, it gives you the option of doing some really basic editing. So you can put, a, um, put some credits on it, you can put title pages on it, you can add music to it. Um, you hit, once you're done, you can just hit a simple button and it uploads it straight to your uh, YouTube channel. But before you do that, it gives you the option of tagging it. So you can start to tag your videos for your kids. You can tag them around units of work, um, you can tag them around themes, around ideas, but it also gives you the ability to create your videos as creative commons. And again, that's a great conversation with your kids around digital citizenship. Greg, um, would you say that that app is effectively the Google video editor? The, the YouTube video editor, is that effectively what it yeah, is? Yeah, I, I probably haven't done a straight comparison, but um, that's, a, that's a really good, I think that's a good call. And, and how would it compare to, say, iMovie on the iPad? A, oh, bit, a bit more basic? Yeah, ve very much uh, okay. a bit more basic. That, that's a great question because the reality is if I was going to do an iMovie, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about uh, Google Capture at all. But if you were just doing, again, if you were doing something fast and dirty, if you just wanted your kids to capture that learning moment, this would be something that they could do and use five or six minutes of lesson time to have a reasonably good product. Yeah. So look, there, there's a couple for you guys to have a look at. But I just want to stop there because one of the things that Greg was um, really concerned, not concerned about, really wanted to um, give you guys some skills around was privacy settings. So I 
I've got a couple here. What I might do is I might pull my iPad back up so that I can uh, show some of this stuff for you. Sorry. There's two areas for me, there's two areas that, uh, that concern me. So the first one is in your general settings and the second one is in your privacy settings. So the first one I might do is just go to my general settings. So in my general settings, um, if I go down, this is all pretty mundane stuff. It, it's pretty clear. It gives you an idea of what you need to do. I myself was unsure what this was though. So this is your background app refresh and it gives you um, the ability to set those apps on your iPad that will be continually using the Wi-Fi to refresh. So things like Gmail, things like your drive. So some of those things I don't mind. Some of those things I'm happy to give, uh, I'm happy to give uh, my iPad access to the Wi-Fi for that. You will notice, however, that there are two little uh, logos there. Next to Google and Google Plus, there's two little blue arrows. It's really important that you know what those arrows are. They are your location services. So at the moment, I have my location services for Google Plus turned off. Now, as a teacher, I can probably go in there and make that decision myself. That's fine. I'm an adult. I'm big enough. I'm ugly enough. I can look after myself. But if I've got a class full of kids, do I want them to have their location services turned on for their Google and for their Google Plus? Now, there's two reasons for that. One is obvious security, so safety and security. That's the first one. The second one is around, uh, again, around digital citizenship. Do I want to have my search results skewed by my location? Now, I'm not sure whether you guys know this, but Google itself works like a funnel. They've got a number of things that they use about what sort of search results that they present to people. So when you type in a specific term and I type in exactly the same term, the search results we both get may be slightly different and they'll be slightly different based on my previous search history. They'll be uh, slightly different based on location. There's a whole algorithm there. So just be aware of that. Uh, Greg, a, a question for you. You've got Google Plus switched off for background app refresh. Yep. But the blue arrow is on. No, so well, the blue arrow is just telling me that that's, um, it'll appear next to an app that wants to use um, my location as part of the background right, refresh. Right, so it's definitely off. Yep. And I've, I've only just turned one on and one off so that you could see that. Yeah, that's yeah. All. That's okay. Okay, so that's the first area. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, that's you know neither here nor there, not really too concerned. Can we have a look at the privacy session? So I've gone down to privacy. There's a couple of things there. If we have a look at location services, there's an awful lot of apps there that want to access my location. And I must admit, again, as an adult, I'm happy to make some of those decisions, but I need to know it's there. So if some of your teachers are using iPads and they're unaware that all of these apps have requested um, access to your uh, location, then you, as an e-learning coordinator, as a person who now knows, you probably need to, um, to have that conversation with your staff. There's something else that's interesting down the bottom. Let me just scroll down. Now, that's probably hard to read. There are three little arrows down the bottom there. There's a purple one, there's a grey one, and there's an outline one. The purple one, and we don't have very many arrows on my uh, apps there because I don't. I normally have a lot of my location services turned off. But if I've got a purple one there, that's an app that has requested access to my location recently, so in the last couple of weeks. The black one is uh, if I've got apps there that have requested access to my locations in the last 24 hours. And if I've got the, uh, the little um, outlined arrow, they're ones that are actually accessing my location now. Now that's, you think about that, if parents had uh, an idea that that was, that was able to be done, there would be people concerned about that. And I'm just gonna jump back to the presentation for one second, because I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. Here is, I'm now having a look 
at a screen that I actually took a screenshot of out of Orasma. Now, I don't know whether you guys know what Orasma is. Orasma is a little app used for creating augmented reality. And I know there's a lot of schools that have used uh, Orasma as a way for kids to present information. Now, I know this is really bad digital citizenship, but this was taken at my home. So you can see that's where I live. That little blue dot there is where I live. And I just turned on, I went to the information in Orasma and it said, have a look at maps. Anyone who has their location settings turned on, it will show up any auras created. Now again, if I'm, if I'm, a, uh, if I'm a deviant, for want of a better word, I could make some assumptions about who's making auras. And if I can find auras, there's a pretty good chance I can find kids. So again, I don't mean to scare people, I just want you to be aware that you can take control of your privacy settings. So, Greg, do you wanna, questions guys? Anyone with questions there? I, and look, again, I don't want to put you off using Orasma. Orasma is a fantastic tool. There's just some limitations, you need to be aware of that. Um, we've got a slightly uh, unrelated question um, from Gay. Uh, Gay Melville. Um, where's Gay from? Gay is from. Uh, she's the AP at St Declan's. So Gay's asking, um, can we create a Google Hangout and invite participants outside of our domain? Um, the answer is yes, you can. Uh, you just get prompted when you uh, add those people to the Hangout. Um, just make you know. It just gets you to confirm that you're happy to have somebody outside of your domain. So, for instance, um, Alma Laroe, who's with us uh, from PLC, she's coming to, into the into this session via uh, VC, the, the video conferencing system, but she could just as easily have joined um, the session via a Hangout. Um, I could just invite her and, and she'd be able to join. Uh, so it doesn't have to be another domain. It could be a personal G, Gmail user. Uh, in fact, they don't even need to have a Google Plus account now. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really quite flexible. I hope that answers your question, Gay. Or was that question around doing it now? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Gay, Gay does, it, does somebody need to, to join us now? Uh, uh, you can unmute your microphone if you like, Gay, and, and ask your question or answer the question. Oh, right. oh hi, and there's um, uh, Marie as well. Hi, Marie. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks guys. Um, and Albine uh, Valier has also has a, um, a question. She's saying, if students bring their own device and we make them aware of privacy setting options, uh, is that adequate for us as we cannot control their own yeah, device? That's, that's a really great question, especially around BYD. <laughs> oh, this is the sort of thing that I would actually um, present to parents. I think I would make it um, part of, not necessarily maybe the information night when you first uh, are pushing out the notion of BYOD, but certainly one of those nights where you're talking about digital citizenship, where you can introduce it to the students, you would introduce it to the parents, you would give the parents the skills just you know once a month or once a six every six weeks that they jump on. Now look, at, as an aside, and I'll give you a prime example, we, we became aware of uh, some software late last week called vShare. And vShare can be downloaded onto the iPad. What it does is it's an alternative app ecosystem. So the kids go, wow, this is cool. I can get free apps. I can, all those apps that I were $4.99 or $9.99, I can get a free version of it. Problem is they're all pirated apps. And this ecosystem has been created uh, somewhere in Asia and they're free for a reason. They're free to get kids to download them onto their iPads. There is significant evidence in the forums and online that um, these are Trojans, they're malware, and that they are being used to strip personal information out of iPads. So, you know, there's a prime example. That's, that's a real pain, but it's also a great teaching moment. So we have that conversation around digital citizenship with our kids. What was that thing called again? V V share, one word, V share. No, I'll just type that in. So yeah. if um, if you want to spend a five minutes tomorrow with your BYOD class 
and uh, just go, oh, can I have a look at your apps on your iPhone? Oh, this is interesting. What's this one? You got a couple of kids with VShare. You need to just pull them aside and have that conversation because uh, they're they're either going to lose the information or they're going to have malware right through their iPads. Now, this is the first instance that we've been aware of of this being able to be done on an iPad. So um, it's a significant um, significant uh, event, I suppose. All right, let's jump back to the presentation. I know we're we're quickly running out of time. About 15 minutes. That's okay. Now, look, I I think. Uh, there will be some really valid things that you might want to use your um, location services for. You just need to be aware that when you enable them, um, you people can pinpoint you down to a particular room in one building. That's how good the GPS is. If I can't find my iPad, I often, rather than go to um, uh, find my device, I just go to my phone and, and um, you know, I can have a look and have a look at Google Maps and you can get it right down to the room. You know, you saw my blue dot there where my house is. If I enlarge that, I can get it right down to a particular room. So there are times when you might want to use it. So I turn it on for maps, I turn it on for weather, and I turn it on for Google Earth. The reality, however, is you might choose to only have those on or you might choose just to put them on um, when you're going to use that service. So the reality is when you've gone into an app and it needs location services, it will actually come up with a little text box, and text box to say, we need to access your location services. But at least you have the choice then to say yes or no. So if you're in your photos, do you really want people to be accessing the geo coordinates? Do you want people to access that metadata around the photographs that you're taking? Um, do you want them to have access to the face recognition? You know, all of these things are, are available if you've got your privacy settings incomplete. The other thing too is, if you're going to use one of those apps, there's no reason why you can't enable it, do what you want to do, and then go back into your privacy settings and disable it once you're done. And, and in fact, you can do that with kids as well. It might be the thing that you just send a, a notification home to say to parents, this is the activity we're going to do, um, we will have location services turned on for the half an hour of the activity, but we will ensure that the students turn them off again at the end. Now this goes right down, even in your privacy settings, to your microphone. Um, I'm always conscious, because we're using VC a lot, that, and we have them in the office here, that we make sure that the cameras and the microphones are turned off. I'd suggest if you've got an iPad, you need to be doing the same thing. So when I go into my iPad, um, I can, and I'll just quickly pull it up again. Um, I can actually see which apps have actually requested access to my microphone. Let's see if we can do this quickly. No? So I go into privacy, uh, location services, uh, microphone. There's all of the apps just on my iPad, and, and I've already I've been telling you all afternoon I don't give very much access to anyone, but they're all the ones that have requested access to my microphone. Now, they really only have to request it once, unless I go back in there and turn it off, they can have access to my microphone whenever they wish. And you need to make your kids aware of that as well. Okay? So again, that's just in privacy and microphones, which is down the bottom there. Microphones. And I can go in and have a look at all of the apps that have requested access to my microphone. Okay. So let's uh, let's finish up. That's just a reminder. I, I think this is what we've got to get our kids um, really au fait with. They need to stop. They need to think. They need to... Um, have the ability and set this up so that each app that they have on their iPad has to ask for permission every time. Then it's their decision or it's a discussion with you around whether they grant access and again, whether they revoke access. All right, so you're all sitting there and I know you're going, hang on, you know, you're all, you're giving us all the sweet stuff, you're giving us all the nice stuff. We know that there are still some problems. So I've tacked that, this onto the end. We do know there are still limitations. And the reality is when we started to do the boot camps, how many years ago? 
two years ago, no, almost two and a half now. Um, this little grid was only half full. And each time we did a boot camp, we, we found that we could add another red dot. Yes, we can do that. Yes, we can do this. We've almost got that full. There's a couple of things that we still can't do. And the main thing for me is still using um, tables on the iPad in Google Docs. Now, I want to I wanna just give you one option here. When you're in Google Drive, you can, if you go right down to the bottom of your um, screen, you still have the option of going to the desktop version. And in the desktop version, oh, I think they've changed it actually, I think it might be in the top right hand corner, they changed it a couple of weeks ago. Um, if you go to the desktop version, it's a little drop down menu, you can do 98% of the things you want to do on the iPad. So look, have a play, it's not perfect yet, we've spoken to Google, um, they're working on it. We've spoken to Apple. They're working on it. I think very, very shortly we're going to see um, a major change in slides, in sites, and in tables. So the, I guess the other thing, and most people are probably aware of this, but with tables, tables don't get displayed when you're in editing mode, but they do get displayed when you're in view mode. right? So you can view a table, you just can't edit it. So I, I, you know, this is my attempt at humour. Sorry, I'll apologise now. Support, I hear you say, yes, and and really, um, Google have a quite a really uh, quite a good page on Google Apps for iOS, and there's the address at the bottom there, um, www.google.com mobile forward slash iOS. They regularly update that. That's something that I would put on your on your calendar just to check every six or eight weeks. Have a look at what they're doing. Have a look at what changes. So as apps are updated, they rotate those apps through. It's just a little uh, picture of the icon, what it does, and how to down download the app. They also have um, a number of other uh, resources that I would suggest. So here's a couple, and I know you'll know that um, uh, some of the old, older or previous Cloud Share offices are obviously signed into some of these. You can um, sign up to these as feeds and they will send you emails every time there's a product update or there's an app update. And we know that people share that on the Google Cloud Share anyway, but there's no reason why you can't go and have a look at those sites as well. That training site's a good site. And the last one I've put there is just a, uh, an iOS 7 on the iPad um, how-to. So it's like a little uh, manual. And that's been put together by Mac One, who are one of our preferred suppliers. So that's sort of me done. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I'm happy to for people to add little things that I may not have covered or uh, to add little tricks and uh, tips. Um, and I might hand back to you guys now. So folks on the Hangout, if you want to ask a question, um, just go ahead and unmute your microphone and happy to take any questions now. Similarly with the folks on the VC. Hi, it's um, Mary from Belfield. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, I just want to check in one of those uh, earlier slides about the sharing directly so that you can have edit, you can edit on an iPad. Would that affect Teacher Dashboard if you send out something through Teacher Dashboard? Is that, is that count as a group of email? Uh, so, so just so I've got that question right, um, so Mary, this is Mary Hill from St Michael's Belfield. You're asking if you send out a document um, which has a table in it? No, no, just any document through Teacher Dashboard and the children open it up on their iPad, are they going to be able to edit it? Because Greg mentioned that um, you need to share a document directly with someone if they're going to edit it. Oh, no, no, no. If you share it via Teacher Dashboard, um, the sharing is already done done for you by Teacher Dashboard. So just to clarify that question, Mary's question was, um, if I'm sharing a document with my students via Teacher Dashboard and the students have iPads, can they still access that document? Absolutely. So they can, okay. it, it will appear in Drive. Yeah, no, but can they edit it? Because um, Greg Swanson... Can pointed... they edit it? Yes. If you... If you choose the uh, make a copy option, then they'll get their own copy of the document, which they can edit. 
That's right. one option. The other yeah. option is share, read and write, which is a single uh, document that you own, but all of the students that you share in your dashboard can also edit it. Now, if that document happens to have a table in it, then they're not going to be able to edit that table on their iPad. Yeah, no, but a table thing I understood, yeah. I just thought when Greg mentioned it, it was um, if you shared a document at, with a group, then they couldn't edit it, couldn't edit it. But yeah, that what, no, what, what Greg, just to clarify that, the way it works is that if you share a document using a group email address, so you click the blue share button, you type in like, you know, CEO Google Guides or some sort of group, what happens is, if you leave the checkbox that says uh, email the person that that that, that the document's been shared with it, they'll see the email come through and they'll be able to click on the link and it will open the document and they can edit it as, as per the permissions you've given. That's no problem. But what doesn't happen is that the document itself doesn't appear in their shared with me section of their Google Drive until they open it the first time, right? So that's that's the difference. So it's the email that allows them to open it for Correct. the first time. Correct, yeah. So it's the email that will allow them to open that document for the first time. Okay, thank Does you. Does that make sense, uh, Mary? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem. Now, we've got another question from Althina on the Hangout. Uh, Althina has asked, um, so can film in Google Capture uh, and edit in YouTube Editor, which gives access to many um, uh, Creative Commons videos that they can use? Um, uh, SS. Students. S uh, students, sorry. <laughs> students so, can you. film in Google. Students can film in Google Capture and edit in YouTube Editor, which gives access to many Creative Commons vi videos that they can use. Thank you. That's a contribution by Alfina. Alfina Jackson over there at um, IHM. Thank you very much. That's great. And look, I've, I've still got uh, my iPad screen up because I just wanted to make one other uh, little observation. If I'm on a Mac, um, I, can, I don't need to necessarily use live to air. I could use QuickTime to record my screen and do exactly the same thing. So look, I, I suppose I just want to give you as many options as possible. And there'd be plenty of people who have done a lot of these things already in schools. So if you're looking for resources, just throw it out to the Google Guides and uh, crowdsource some of those solutions. Okay. Um, any other questions, folks? We all done? No, can I just ask a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, sure. It's Marianne from St Mark's. And Thanks, I just want to tell Greg that I got on this afternoon. Oh, yes, I, I saw you very early. I'm very happy oh, that good. you're there. Right, good. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> so, look, okay. if I can just explain that to everyone. Um, St. Uh, St. Mark's of Tremoyne have had a lot of problem with their Jabber. And uh, Mary and I, Marianne and I spent about an hour this morning sorting that. So it's we're celebrating the fact that she's here this afternoon. <laughs> very good. Congratulations, Marianne. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.